Okay, I am live. Okay. <clears throat> uh, first of all, welcome everyone um, to Discovering Mysterious Malaysians. Um, this is a virtual event as uh, on behalf of the Society for Conservation Biology Malaysia chapter. And um, today, to celebrate World Wildlife Day, we have curated about, we've curated a few wildlife that you can find in Malaysia. And we've decided uh, to choose these species because we think um, that they are on the lesser known side. Everybody knows about tigers, elephants, and bears. But what we're going to share with you today is what we, is what, what I would consider somehow mysterious because they're either not studied very well or people just don't see them very often. Um, so before we start, I'd just like to remind everyone that this session will be around, I aim for it to be around maximum 40 minutes. But after that, I will share a link for us to go on a Netflix watch party um, where we will watch BBC's Night on Earth episode, The Jungles. So if uh, for those of you who haven't been on a Netflix watch party before, um, while I give this talk, you can quickly download the Netflix watch party extension and um, install it onto your Google Chrome. And um, I will share a link to join us on the Netflix watch party later. So you can just click the link and it will bring you to Netflix and we can watch it at the same time and we, there will also be a chat box. Um, also, uh, the Netflix watch party is only available to those who are subscribed to Netflix. So I'm so sorry <laughs> to those who do not have uh, a Netflix account. Uh, you can though uh, quickly sign up for a seven day free trial and this is not a Netflix ad just by the way. So allow me to introduce myself. My name is Natasha Zulaika. I am the communications executive for the Society for Conservation Biology. I am also currently a PhD student with the Management and Ecology of Malaysian Elephants, or MIM, based at the University of Nottingham. Um, before this, I was working with an NGO called MyCat uh, to conserve the Malayan tigers. And um, so in general, I think I would say I'm quite a wildlife geek. So um, don't mind me if I get a little bit excited while explaining to you guys the species that I have today. Um, before I begin, I see there are about almost 20 people watching live. Do you guys mind typing in the chat box where are you guys watching from? Um, it'll be I'm assuming everyone is watching from Malaysia, but it'll be cool to know if there's anyone not in Malaysia. Um, also, before I start again, <laughs> uh, there will be a few members from the Society of Conservation Biology in the uh, YouTube chat box. So feel free to interact with them. Um, this will be a really relaxed session. Um, thank you again for tuning in on your Wednesday night to geek out on wildlife with me. So yeah, let's start. <clears throat> Wait. Okay, let's start. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, so first, the first mysterious wildlife we have today on the left is called a Sunda uh, stink badger. It is actually a relative of the skunk. It looks like the skunk too, but it's, it's not the same. Um, you can only find these um, stink badgers in Borneo, Sumatra, and Java. There's none in Peninsula Malaysia, but there is a different kind of badger that you can get in um, closer to Thailand, and that is called a hog badger. So it's kind of different. So they usually eat on small um, invertebrates, small animals, and even tuberous roots. Um, I wanted to say that it will be useful for you guys to 
quickly go to your kitchen and maybe ambil a packet of satu kg tepung <laughs> so that when I describe these animals, you guys can kind of know like how big they are. Or if you have a ruler also, that will be good because I will be referring to like some measurement. But don't worry if you don't. Yeah, so back to the stink badger. Because they are relatives to skunks, to defend themselves, they actually also emit a really pungent and foul smelling milky green secretion when they're about to get attacked. And this milky, pungent smell secretion um, is known to make humans ping sign because of the smell. And if it's aimed properly, it's, it's been recorded that dogs have turned blind because of its secretion. So it is sort of like a skunk club. It's like an Asian skunk. Um, on the right side, we have an otter civet. So this is a photo from a camera trap um, in Borneo. Uh, a funny story about the ot otter civet is that when I was working with my cat, um, so we set up cameras and I was looking through the photos and I got a glimpse of this guy and it wasn't a beautiful photo like this one. But um, me and my colleague couldn't ID what the animal was. And we were so convinced, instead of opening a field guide, we, were, we believed that we discovered a new species. Because <laughs> that is how uncommon this otter civet is. You just really can't see them. And it's, it's quite an extraordinary being because they live mostly on the trees, but they are also quite close to the rivers. So they fit, they... They feed on semi-aquatic, um, yeah, they feed on fish or like inverts that are around. The otter civet is slightly bigger than the ba uh, the badger because they're around like five kilos, so five bags of your tepung in your kitchen. Mm, yeah, uh, you can find them in uh, Southern Thailand, Peninsula Malaysia, Sumatra, and also Borneo. Okay, I want you guys to really look at this video and see how this guy moves. Yeah. Yeah, so I think about in 2000, yeah, 2019, there was this photo at the bottom. Um, someone accidentally caught this kolugo and um, WhatsApp me messages were like spreading around of this specific photo saying something like Haiwan mystery telah ditangkap. And at the same time, there were also videos of cuttlefish swimming in the ocean. And for some reason, people put two and two together and thought that they were swimming. These creatures could swim, but it wasn't. It's not. It's two different complete. It's two completely different species. So this is called a Sunda flying lemur or a kolugo. The kolugo um, has, um, so the kolugo doesn't have wings. It, they have this very thin membrane called a pathogium. And um, with these membranes, they glide from tree to tree. And they are known to glide up to 60 meters. And an Olympic size, an Olympic size swimming pool is 50 meters, so they can glide for more than that length, which I think is incredible. Um, you can find these guys in Myanmar, in Southern Thailand, in, in Malaysia, both Peninsula and Borneo, and also Sumatra and Java. There's actually only two species of the Koluko in the entire family. Um, the second species you can only find in Philippines. And they don't do well in captivity simply because they need a lot of space to glide around. Like I said, they could glide up to 60 meters and that helps keep their membrane dry. So in captivity, they don't get to do that. And But in the wild, um, with current deforestation rates and land clearing, they don't have much space to glide from tree to tree anymore because trees aren't missing. So 
this it's, it's quite a sad reality that um, Kolugos might face. I saw Ahmad Pat said, amongst all gliding animals, Kolugos are the best gliders. I would think so too. They are, if you can actually see the photo on top, the Kolugos young is clinging onto the mum while the mum glides. I think that's pretty amazing. So next we have, oh, the next one is quite cool. Ha. Huh. I feel like these two geckos is a proper a proper Malaysian. <laughs> so this is the roti canai rock gecko and the teh tarik gecko or tebu mountain slender slender toad gecko. So the story behind these geckos is that um a herpetologist or a biology professor his name is Lee, Lee Grismer from the University of La Sierra in California. Um, him, he assembled a group of scientists in Malaysia to go around and start discovering um, the species we haven't discovered before. So in the case of the Roti China Gecko, they actually found it in Pulau Langkawi. And just so happens that when they were looking for this gecko, it was in Ramadan. And the only food that they could get at that time was roti canai. I'm assuming because pasta, everything else is closed except for mamaks. So, um, and thanks to the internet, now we have a photo of a gecko on a roti canai. <laughs> and um, you can only find, so far you can only find this lizard in Langkawi on Gunung Raya, yes. And similar story to the, <clears throat> similar story for the Tetarik Gecko, same team, um, only the, the Tetarik Gecko was found in Trenganu, in a place called Gunung Tebu, like the name, Tebu Mountain. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> uh, he, are geckos like chicha but big and colorful? Actually, your house chicha is called geckos. But these geckos, uh, you can only find in this specific area. They, they, they are endemic. So um, what's interesting um, that I read about this professor, he said that um, Southeast Asia is actually home to 23% of global biodiversity. And even so, um, there's still so much more to discover. And um, he described in the news that him and his team will spread around the forest and turn every single leaf, every single rock to see if they can find something. So there you go, our very Malaysian uh, roti canai gecko and teh tarik gecko. Next, <clears throat> we have, I, I find that this species on the left is super, super, super interesting. Um, you can only find them in Penang Hill and um, they're called the vampire crab. Now, a student called, uh, her name was Siti Kadija and um, She's a master, she was a master student with UMT, along with Professor Madia, Dr. Amiruddin. And um, they conducted a 12-month study on Penang Hill uh, on freshwater crabs. And so they found this guy living in this plant. And this vampire crab is actually so small, it's as big as your toenail. And, sorry, thumbnail. Thumbnail is smaller, yes, thumbnail. And um, she shared, um, Siti, Khadija, Siti Khadija shared that they found this crab specifically in this plant. And this plant actually, um, it's sort of like takung ai. And because they, it takungs ai, mosquitoes um, lay their eggs there and the larvas are can survive in the plant. So this crab is actually a form of biological control um, for the nyamoks, a teeny, teeny, tiny crab that you can only find in Penang Hill. 
Yep, correct. You can only find it above 700 meters. And um, on the right, we have a Wallace flying frog. Now, usually you see flying frogs are on the ground, but this guy only comes to the ground uh, when he needs to look for a girlfriend or, look, or, or a boyfriend, you know, to meet. And um, you can find these um, flying frogs in uh, Peninsula Malaysia and Borneo. And um, they can leap with their webbed feet up to 15 meters. And um, there are many other flying frogs, but this one specifically is one of the largest. And um, they are the size of a teacup, roughly, like um, four inches. And um, they, interestingly enough, actually, they breed in wallows of um, big mammals. So they are known to lay eggs in um, the wallows of uh, the rhinos, um, but then rhinos are officially extinct in Malaysia. So I'm guessing now that the frogs will have to lay eggs in other forms of um, wallows of big mammals, like maybe tape. But wallows are known to be like a bit stinky and the, the water is marshy. So I'm surprised at how um, they can lay eggs in there for for it and it and it survives. So I think that's pretty cool. So the next video, I kind of want you guys to um, like pay attention a little bit. And the moment the video starts, I want you to count how many of those creatures you see um, in the yeah in the frame. I hope it plays. Okay, it's playing. Oh no, it's loading. Okay, it's playing. Okay, the internet is not very good. Okay, okay. it's playing, it's playing. Okay, never mind. <laughs> While it plays, I'm just going to throw you some facts about our doll. So the doll is also known as an Asiatic wild dog, or some people also call it the red dog. And if you look at it, a lot of people say like, oh, macam fox ke? Oh, macam wolves ke? Um, but it's actually in the same family. They're in the family Canidae. And in Malay, the folklore usually call them Serigala. So this is the Malaysian Serigala lah. Uh, similar to wolves, they live in packs. Um, the packs can go from uh, as small as uh, five individuals up to 40 individuals. It's been reported before. And because they are in such large packs, um, they can take down animals 10 times larger than their size. So um, they are really smart creatures in that way. They are very efficient hunters, leapers, and yeah, you can see they they have such a beautiful coat that they blend so well with the tanah behind. Um, what else? Oh yeah, you can find them in Peninsula Malaysia, but you can't find them in Borneo, which was a fact that I just learned a couple of days ago. And um, a female doll um, can have. Uh, when it gives birth, it can give birth up to 12 pups, and that's a lot. And um, the doll is known, the female doll has more breasts than any other canid species. So I'm going to, unfortunately, this video is not going very well. Um, but, okay, it's quite okay now. But you can see how beautiful they are, and they're, if I counted correctly, they, there was five individuals in that video. I may be wrong, but you can watch it, you can watch this later on YouTube. Um, you can just search for uh, Dole WWF Malaysia. The doll gets really, really close to the photographer, and um, the moment it notices that there's someone there, it 
runs away like like really fast. Yeah. Okay, so moving on. Um, I don't know if you can see if you can spot the moth. This moth is, I might pronounce it wrong, but it's called a ping, pingasa ruginaria. Hmm. Um, personally, I am scared of moths and butterflies, but when I look, when I saw this photo, it was just incredible how it camouflaged so well that I decided to put it in this slideshow. I was like, you guys have to see this. This moth is incredible. Um, so this moth you can find all around Southeast Asia and they are known to camouflage on a few types of trees um, but the trees that I recognize are um, they, they tend to camouflage on cashew trees, wild cashews. There are about 860 species of wild cashews and um, they also blend in cinnamon trees and out of the 26 cinnamon trees, um, 17 of them are endemic to Borneo. So endemic, just in case um, none of uh, you guys are not from a science background, endemic means that you can only find this species in that location. So for example, the cinnamon trees, there are 26 um, cinnamon tree types of cinnamon trees in the world, but 17 you can only find in Borneo. Um, yeah, and it also blends in rambutan trees, which I thought was really cool. And the shiny creature you see next to it, um, I actually encountered it for the first time last year. This is my photo. I was brushing my teeth, getting ready for bed at the field house. And from my headlamp, I was like looking around, brushing, and I noticed something shiny like sliding in the longkang. And I looked at it and I was like, what are you? I have no idea what you are. And we quickly took a photo and turns out it's a Sicilian. This thing is called a Sicilian. And I'm wondering, does, is anybody watching? Like, have you guys heard of a Sicilian before? because I've only learned this very, very recently. So uh, type in the chat box if you guys seen a Sicilian before and where did you find it? I think they are incredibly elusive and really, really cool. Apparently a friend saw it on Pulau uh, Lang Tengah as well. I'm, he didn't have a picture, so I wouldn't, we couldn't ID the, speech, the specific species, but they might just be there. So there are 200 species of Sicilians living in tropical forests. Um, you can find them also in Cameroon and Colombia. Um, not much is known about the Sicilian, except that they are burrowing worms and um, they have a few layers of teeth. And in Brazil, a scientist brought a Sicilian to the lab. And when he was, um, <laughs> like when he was looking through, I mean, like, what's the scientific? Okay, he was just checking out the Sicilian in the lab. And he noticed that the saliva of the Sicilian is actually um, venomous. Probably not to us, but we wouldn't know. Um, yeah, so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, anybody seen a Sicilian before? <laughs> Next, we have these really, really adorable and cute um, squirrels. The one on the right, which is the Gentinx flying squirrel, looks like your sugar glider, but it's not. And just in case you guys don't know, sugar gliders are not from Malaysia. Um, so the flying squirrels, um, the flying squirrels, 90% of the species around the world, you can actually only find in Asia. And out of 
all the species, 14 of them you can find in Borneo. Um, so just now, the colugo could um, glide around, the colugo can glide around 60 meters. But these guys can glide up to 150 meters, which is three Olympic swimming pools. They are mainly nocturnal, meaning they're active at night. And um, their diet consists of fresh young leaves, um, fruits and seeds. You can find them in the Krismilan, you can find them in Langkawi, in Pahang and in Sabah. And um, we will be moving on to my last um, terrestrial animal, which is one of my favorites. It is the marbled cat. So um, type in the chat box if you guys haven't heard of this species before. The marbled cat is an elusive uh, small cat that is mainly arboreal, meaning it always um, it's always in the trees. Um, it hunts things like squirrels, probably the flying squirrels that we saw just now, or maybe not. Um, rats and birds and also bats. Um, in my previous experience of doing camera trapping, um, it's really, really difficult to spot uh, these marble cats because they're always in the trees, they're barely on the ground. And you can find these marbled cats in Nepal, in other parts of uh, Southeast Asia, in, in Malaysia, uh, in Sumatra and Malaysia and Borneo. Yeah, it has a really long and bushy tail, so that helps it balance when it's on the trees. So, I hope this next video will play smoothly because it's a very, very interesting creature. Are marble cats and leopard cats the same species? They're not. Um, the Asian leopard cats are smaller and um, the Asian leopard cats don't have a big bushy tail. Uh, they look completely different. Um, the spots are different and even their facial features are different. Our marble cats, kucing hutan. They live in the hutan, but as Malaysians, everything that is not like a regular cat, we call kucing hutan. Technically, harimau also is like a big kucing hutan. <laughs> so, yes, marble cat is a kucing hutan, and Asian leopard cat is also a um, kucing hutan. Yeah. Um, before I get into the marine part of the presentation, are any of you divers? Um, has anyone dived around Malaysia? And if so, uh, let me know where. I just recently picked up my uh, diving license and I haven't really been around, so I never really seen um, this species that I'm about to share with you, but let me know if you do, it'll be really exciting. So, I hope it goes well. Yeah, 
So that video was actually taken in Australia, but the photo on the right was taken in Mabul Island in Sabah. So these crabs are called orangutan crabs, and they're actually really, really tiny. Um, their carapace, uh, their back shells are only known to be 2 cm big, and they usually rest on corals like this one. It's on a bubble coral. Um, What's interesting about this crab is it's part of a family called the decorator crabs. And decorator crabs are, a, are oh sorry, I'm getting distracted. Um, the decorator crabs are known to pick up little things on the ocean floor and put them on their backs. And they do this to hide from predators. Um, and uh, like this, the video mentioned, I'm not sure if you guys could hear the audio very clear. Uh, the um, orangutan crabs actually just swim and because they have the bulu bulu, food will get stuck on their body and they just go like, oh, hey, thank you, food. <laughs> Next, we have um, sea stars. I was told that we actually we, we can't call them starfish because they're not a fish, so we have to call them sea stars. So on the left, we have what we call a chocolate chip sea star, which I thought was very funny. Um, and this photo was taken in Mabul. Um, you can find these sea, sea stars across the Indo-Pacific and the chocolate chips are actually spines um, for them to protect themselves from predators. And the star sea star on the right is called a heavy sea star. And um, they are known to grow up to one meter long, a one meter big and six kilos they weigh six kilos <laughs> and um you can find the heavy starfish if in malaysia in indonesia and all the way in hawaii as well so um there are about two thousand different species of sea stars and um, sea stars live in shallow waters and they're actually predators so they play quite a crucial role in maintaining the balance of the ecosystem um, also some species of sea stars are used as an indicator species so um, an indicator species is the scientists use indicator species to know um, the condition of um, that habitat. So for example, uh, a, a specific sea star would have very, very specific requirements for it to survive in that location. So if you see the sea star, it could mean that, ah, okay, so this water, this habitat or this section ha is free of toxic chemicals, for example, or this part um, or this habitat is rich in oxygen for it to survive. So that's how scientists use indicator species. And some starfish are used as indicator species. So next. Next is, okay, if you are a diver, um, there are a large group of divers who go crazy for these guys. These are called nudie branch, and they're actually really, really tiny sea slugs. Um, when I say tiny, if you have a ruler, I don't have a ruler. Oh, okay, I have a ruler. They can only, they, they are about four centimeters to 10 centimeters. Like that, that's how big they are in the water, like that. And the really flashy green nudie branch is called a leaf sheep sea slug and it's the only um, animal a multicellular animal to be able to perform photosynthesis 
and usually photosynthesis uh, only plants can um, go through photosynthesis but these guys because they eat so much algae that they're able to photosynthesize um, and if you really look at them they look so unreal if you notice how different um, terrestrial animals and marine animals are the marine animals just look like they're out of this world i personally feel they, they look so like alien <laughs> and yeah just look at this guy with his little two eyes and a little purple antennas but anyways and then you see the ghost uh the ghost nudie the whole body is actually transparent and um you can only see like the tubes and the veins and this photo was taken in sabah um in 2008 oh the sheep sea slug um that it was spotted in tioman recently and um nudie branches just as a gen um uh, generally um have toxic secretions or even stinging shell cells stinging cells to protect them from um predators and some are even known to eat toxic sponges and then they alter and store the toxic that they get from the sponges and use them later on. Um, I would really recommend you guys to go on YouTube and watch videos of um, nudie branches like um, eating or like walking on the ocean floor because they are incredible, incredible creatures. It's so vibrant. This I couldn't choose um the specific moody branch that i wanted to um show today but th these are these are the the ones that made the cut but there's so much more they're so beautiful so next is this weird looking guy and notice how he's trying to blend in and there's orange thingies around him yeah those are sponges and he just hides in and he looks exactly like the sponge and this makes them really really great um, ambush predators so the frog fish is really good at camouflaging that it is so good at camouflaging that you can find in all sorts of colors black adder white adder pink adder blue adder and um because they can change their color and they can change their texture within days, it's really, really difficult for us to really identify the specific species. So we can just generally say, oh yes, that, that is a frogfish. <laughs> we cannot say which specific frogfish. But I don't know about you guys, but when I, see, when I saw that photo that this guy, Joseph Crow, took in Pahantian, when I saw that face, I was just like, this this fish must go like the <laughs> because it looks so weird. I'm very sure when I was diving around Malaysia, these guys were just hiding, but I can't see them because they they just camouflage so so well. So next we have the pygmy seahorse. I don't know about you guys, but it's kind, it feels kind of gully right now <laughs> for me when I look at the photos. Um, these pygmy seahorses was um, first seen in Sabah around 2004, and um, when it was when someone made like told the news like, "Hey, I found a pygmy seahorse," hundreds of divers rushed to Sabah just to uh, take photos of this specific seahorse and this seahorse are so small it's, it's the smallest is 1.4 cm yeah that's small and the biggest is almost 3 cm so they're tiny they're really really tiny and because these divers were so excited they, they want to take photos of the seahorses they even broke uh, pieces of the sea fan for them to ali ali can and make like a good angle and a good photo you know and that, that that's not 
that's not great, that's not good, you shouldn't do that, and you shouldn't touch um, corals or any wildlife that you see terrestrial or underwater. So um, the, the, there was a scientist in Sabah who created a workshop to overcome this problem, like told them the ethics of diving. But anyway, you can find these pygmy seahorses in Japan, in Indonesia, Northern Australia, New Caledonia, and um, in Sabah, Lucky Earth. And um, out of all the species of pygmy seahorses, two species, including this one, are known to live only on gorgonian corals, which is the one in the photo, or um, sea fans. And um, I just learned this today. Seahorses need to eat all the time because they have no stomach. And this I already knew, that males are the ones who give birth and take care of their um, young. This, this, that they specifically do this because by the time the male is developing the young in the tummy, the female is creating more eggs. And by the time he gives birth, the female will be ready. Okay, like, dude, are you ready? I have more eggs. And bam. They have more babies. Uh, they can, But they can only have up to 34 youngs at a time. So it's not that much if you really think about it. Um, next is... Okay, I hope you saw Ah, so the, these are coral cat sharks. And um, so this video was shot in Sabah, um, but you can also find them in Peninsula. I've seen them in Pulau Langtenga in Trenganu, and they are so beautiful. They're so like long and slender in the spots. They just they, they really hypnotize you. So the next species is one of my absolute 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 favorites and it's the blue ring octopus and um sadly you can see one on a skewer that's already cooked um but this photo is not in malaysia this photo is in thailand but around sometimes last year um the Department of Marine and Coastal Resources Thailand had to quickly warn everyone to not eat this um, blue ringed octopus because despite its size, it's only the size of a golf ball. They're very small, but they have enough um, neurotoxins to kill 26 people within minutes they they have really powerful um, neurotoxins called tetrodotoxin which is in the same um, puffer fishes have the same toxin too but they're really fast and um, um, they're, they're extremely um, toxic and uh, the blue rings actually don't light up all the time and uh, these octopus, even though they're so beautiful, 
they live up to only two years. So the male and the female, after they mate, the male will um, die and the female will stay for the next six months to make sure all the eggs um, survive. But when she does this, when she takes care of her eggs, she doesn't go out to hunt. So she, um, so she stays there starving and by the time they're all hatched, she also dies. But they, she lays eggs like millions of eggs, and, but only a couple survive. So um, it's really, it's really, it's a really interesting um, life history, a life cycle that they have. And this will be the last wildlife that I will share for today. And just pay attention to how those little tentacles reach out and how these corals grow. It's really mesmerizing. So these are called the staghorn corals, and they are one of the fastest growing corals. Um, yeah, the, the one of the fastest growing corals, and they uh, actually provide habitats for many marine life. Um, corals are known to be um, like a nursery for young fish, and um, corals actually have a symbiotic relationship with an algae called uh, zooxanthellae. This is what gives them colors. Um, and the zooxanthellae uh, is the one processing nutrients and passing it on to the corals. But the corals also use the little tentacles that you saw just now um, to hunt. And um, these little tentacles have stinging cells called nematos nematocysts. And um, corals all around the world are threatened by rising sea temperatures. So when the waters get too warm, the zooxanthellae that lives in the coral will um, be forced to expel themselves. And um, the corals, this is why the corals turn, uh, this is why the corals bleach and turn white. And um, all around the world, we see this um, incident or coral bleaching happening very widely. And Malaysia is no stranger to that incident as well. So I think I shared about 20 species already. And I'm, I think if you guys still have enough space, <laughs> Um, we will, we shall move on to our Netflix watch party after this. But before that, I'd just like to share. These are the list of wildlife conservation NGOs in Malaysia. Uh, feel free to screenshot them. Um, give them a follow on their respective social media pages. And if you're wondering what is it that you can do, um, to help wildlife, um, you can do so by supporting these organizations. They usually are non-governmental organizations, so they run on a donation basis. Um, also, um, I've listed the hotlines available uh, in Malaysia. So if you go to a restaurant and suddenly they serve you um, exotic meat or they they serve you um like for example oh here we have uh, kuching hutan or here we have um 
daging harimau. So you can report them to these hotlines. Um, you could also report things like your neighbors keeping wildlife as pets, um, or if you see people in the forest and they don't really look like regular hikers. So feel free to screenshot this page and save these numbers on your phone. We always need extra eyes and ears to look out and take care of our um, local biodiversity. It's the responsibility of all of us. And also here I've listed um, Instagrams of um, people I follow for um, Malaysian wildlife photography. I've used some of the photos in their slides as well, if you guys noticed. And um, yeah, give them a follow. They always take photos of local wildlife if you guys want to learn more and they take beautiful, beautiful photos. Um, for more events like this, please follow SCP Malaysia. We're on Twitter and we're on Instagram. You could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And I hope this session was beneficial to you guys. I had lots of fun curating, researching um, facts about these animals. And I hope you guys learned a new thing or two. And I will, I need to share the Netflix watch party link with you guys. I will drop it in the in the chat box. Okay. Okay. So I've shared this link in the chat box, drop in um, so we can watch this documentary together. It's about an hour, but there's a chat box on the side as well on this Netflix watch party. So we can chit chat while we watch this documentary. And um, I hope you guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this session. And thank you very much. Bye.